Hello there, I'm Joe Seaman, the Heritage Manager for Eastbourne Borough Council and I am giving you a brief introduction now to my talk of Scientists and Shepherds which is part of this fabulous Making Natural History uh, Festival and it's a talk that's quite close to my heart because it's about stories and it's about storytelling and it's about how people have made connections with each other and the landscape and about how in, intertwined those connections are going sort of back through time. It's essentially about a meeting of two minds, two people you might think are polar opposites but actually had so much in common. And from that meeting their friendship grew and also it helps us to understand a little bit more about the landscape around us today by looking at what those two people were discussing. Um, it also shows how connected we are to the landscape and to the stories that still dwell within that landscape. So I hope you enjoy it. I recorded it as live um, so you'll get a live experience of this talk. Um, unfortunately I couldn't be live tonight to do it so I hope you enjoy it um, and away we go of scientists and shepherds. So here we go then, of scientists and shepherds, the interconnected stories of the Eastbourne Downs and why they are relevant today. Or in other words, it's going to be a bit of a ramble, a virtual ramble across the Downs through time, through history, through the landscape, via many twists and twer turns and more rabbit holes you can think of. In fact, I should say this talk is only, this is a shortened version of the one that I sort of can do about this. This is just a glimpse into the depth of history and environment and nature that exists on our doorstep. And I think that's what I'm trying to get over to you today. It's more about understanding what's going on around us and the fact that what we see today hasn't always been the same. And it's it's a, it's a landscape of hidden stories. It's a landscape that has so much to offer us for now about the past and about the future. Um, now, this is recorded live, as I've already said, so you'll probably hear the bells of the town hall behind me, potentially traffic, but I'm just going to go, keep going as normal. Um, I want you to get <laughs> the experience of one of my live talks, which, um, as this one will show you, aren't always as straightforward as uh, some others. So, first of all, let's look at this beautiful picture of the the downs are taken from the Beachy Head Centre, um, looking out across Bullock Down towards Bell Two, the sun setting in the distance. Absolutely stunning. But perhaps this is the image that uh, a lot of us think about when we look at the downs. A bleak, inhospitable place, in this case, covered in mist. In fact, the photo here was taken um, in the morning. So it was a morning of a day where we experienced all four seasons. Started off like this, it moved on to rain and showers, then we had wind and finally that sunset. Believe it or not, that was all on this one day. It just shows the changing nature of the downs around Eastbourne and particularly around Beachy Head. It, it's a place of contradictions, of um, strangeness, deep strangeness, but also deep beauty. It's a place that I think people have been attracted to for thousands of years, but it's not always looked the same or felt the same. Uh, climate's changed, for instance. But we're going to go on this ramble now. We're going <clears> to <throat> have a look where it takes us. Most of this is probably going to be unplanned. I use the images on the screen to, to remind me of the stories I was going to tell you, but I don't always stick to them. So let's see how this goes. There you go. That's what we'll be talking about. This is my mind map. Um, as you can see, there's red and green. There's no reason for those two uh, colours, just the fact that um, it shows me different uh, trains of thought. But it just shows how complex this story of the Downs is. So when you see a book, The Story of the Downs, don't necessarily believe it's going to tell you that. It's going to tell you one part of that story, maybe a nuanced view. Whereas hopefully this talk is going to explore the depths of the Downs and just look at how interconnected everything is. And we're going to take as a starting point the meeting of, of two very different men, but also they had a, a lot in common. So let's... Oh no, let's not. Let's start with chalk. Yeah, why not? Let's not talk about people. The Downlands, as, as I'm sure many of you will know, 
are built on chalk. The reason why we have the grasslands, the flora and the fauna is because of the geology. Chalk is absolutely amazing. Not only does it give us this, this iconic view of these cliffs jutting up from the sea, and more of that later, but it actually means that the flora and therefore the fauna that live on there are very specialised to living in conditions which, uh, which favour the, 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 the uh, calcium-based um, uh, calcium carbonate, sorry, based uh, uh, geology and soils that we have. We also have deep patches of clay on the downs, which have an altogether different environment associated with them, still chalk downland, but, but different again. It's an incredible space. But when you see it like this, this white starkness, it looks like it's been there forever. It looks like it's, it's, it's these uplands rising up. But actually, what we, what we know about chalk is that it's a very different story. Chalk itself uh, was was really a living organism. You're basically standing on the bodies of microorganisms and macroorganisms dating back millions of years. In fact, around 120 to 90 million years ago, that chalk was actually the bottom of a, a shallow sea, a vast shallow sea that ran right over from what is now Britain over towards the east of Europe and, and, and to areas like Poland. It was a, a habitat in its own right. There were millions of different um, uh, animals living in the seas, including things that are more familiar with us today, um, especially if we watch things like Jurassic Park. Mosasaurs, these swimming reptiles, but ammonites and belemites and all these sea creatures, which again, I certainly grew up looking at pictures of. They were all part of the, this environment. And when they died, their bodies sank down to the bottom of the sea. And uh, over years and millions of years of pressure, and change, they became fossilised. They became part of the rock. So those those headlands that we're walking on, we think we're at the top of the world, particularly if you're around Beachy Head and Bell too. Actually, you're at the bottom of a sea. But this this fascination with what was under our feet, and with the led to the meeting of two great minds. They're both great, both very different. Um, first of all, we'll meet the scientist himself. This is Thomas Henry Huxley, a renowned 19th century scientist. I won't go into the great deals about him. You can look him up. He's a fascinating character. But he actually lived in Eastbourne just for five years, from 1890 to 95. In his life, he had uh, been many things, an anthropologist and a biologist. But he's probably best known today for being known as Darwin's bulldog. In fact, he was one of the, the pallbearers at, at Darwin's funeral. He hadn't always seen eye to eye with Darwin, hadn't always ag agreed with the, the incredible theory of, of evolution. Um, but he came round to it. He came to understand that it, it had to be the way because of his understanding of things like anatomy. Um, and he was an incredible artist as well, I should say. And on, a, and on a side there, art, art and the downs. That is a whole topic we could look into. The amount of inspiration that this landscape has 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 caused in people, it, 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 it led to an explosion of art, particularly sort of in the 19th century and then the middle of the 20th century. I'm sure art historians will pick me up on this. But it seems to be carrying on today. So this idea that art has been around in the downs forever is it, it, a very true one. But back to Huxley. Oh, by the way, I'll do that all the way through this as I think of something. I'll go off on a tangent, but never mind. We'll get back to the story. So Huxley himself, by this time, an eminent uh, scientist, supporter of Darwin, not popular with everyone, because there were still, even in this late period, many people who disagreed adamantly with Darwin's views, and particularly because Huxley invented agnosticism. Um, in fact, here he says, agnosticism, in fact, is not a creed, but a method, the essence of which lies in the rigorous application of a single principle, the fundamental axiom of modern science. In matters of intellect, follow your reason as far as it will take you, without regard to any other consideration. In matters of the, in matters of the intellect, do not pretend that conclusions are certain, which are not demonstrated or demonstrable. And so that, that statement in, its, in itself caused huge problems, particularly in the religious community, but in, in general society. But by the, by the end of the Victorian people, there were more people coming over to these ideas and realising how great a man that Huxley was. Now, by the time he moved down to Eastbourne, that's his house there, um, uh, which is, it was on Staveley Road. 
I believe there's a blue plaque there today. Um, he was not in good health. He, he was ailing. He had had heart problems. He had had severe depression. Um, he, he wasn't in a good way. And he came down to live in Eastbourne because Eastbourne was seen at the time as a place to recuperate, to get yourself better, to take the air, all of these things. Eastbourne had, was a booming uh, tourist destination at this point, but mostly not just for day trippers and things like that. That wasn't really a thing. This was a, a destination for people who wanted to experience the clean living of, of sea air and downland air. Walking was prescribed to people. Get out in the downs and walk. And again, this is an idea we're coming back to today, isn't it? It's, we're now getting social prescriptions where we're told to get out, go walking, cycling. And it, it, it does, certainly does work. It, it helps your mental health, no end. And this is what, uh, was, what, what Huxley decided to do. He moved down here. And he spent a lot of time walking the downs. He was, he was a great collector of fossils and things like that. And obviously the, the downs drew him. Um, like a, a red rag to a bull, I suppose, in that he knew what lay under the, his feet up there. And he spent a lot of time pondering as well whilst he was up there and thinking about this this deep time and what was going on in it. A scientist meets a shepherd. Stephen Blackmore, um, one of the, the last, in fact, shepherds of the Downs, the great shepherds. We'll talk a bit more about shepherding later on. But by Blackmore's day, he was looking after a huge flock of sheep, could be sort of 600 strong, on his own on the Downs. And those sheep, they actually belonged to different people, they're different owners. But he would look after the entire flock and then be paid by the different owners. Um, it was a really hard life. He lived on the Downs, he worked on the Downs. As you can see here, this picture of him, he's about 60 years old. Actually looks quite a lot older there, doesn't he, Stephen? Um, with his wife outside their cottage near Frost Hill. Um, and here you can see, you might just be able to see that his, his right arm is missing. And it, it indeed, he'd lost his right arm in a, a threshing incident when he was a young man. He also had a, a dog, obviously, with him, and his dog was part blind. But it was the dog that... Stephen Blackmore himself had trained, so he, he didn't want to work with any other. They had this uh, synergy going on the Downs. He, you could argue that people like Stephen Blackmore, who spent their life on the Downs, not always around Beachy Head, but on the Downs predominantly all, all his life, became part of it. They certainly have become part of the story. He almost looks part of the Downs, doesn't he? He looks weather-beaten, worn, but still determined and actually quite happy. And he was a fascinating guy, Stephen Blackmore. He, as, as you may expect, and for those days, he, he wasn't well educated, but he was incredibly bright. He, he was one of these people who had a, a natural in, inquisitiveness, and he started picking things up on the Downs, fossils that he recognised, and uh, uh, other things like the sort of Neolithic flint tools. And he recognised that these were man-made objects, and he started thinking about them, and he th thought very deeply about them, about these other people who had lived and come before him. We've got to start thinking about people, not just like photographs and names in books. These are people. It's one of the hardest concepts. I, I keep coming back to it time and time again. This, this sort of thinking about sort of my past even and my memories and the fact that really now they're, they're, they are just, they're just that, they're memories, they're, they're imagination. I can't be sure that what I remember is, is true, but I know I did certain things. And in just the same way, it's hard to imagine people like Stephen Blackmore living up on the Downs and doing his thing. But he was there. These are real people with real feelings. And I, I do sort of have an affinity to people like Stephen Blackmore and, in fact, Huxley as well. I should say when the scientist met the shepherd, you might think, oh, the these are two great contrasts, this educated man and a lowly shepherd. It's not so. Huxley was, in fact, not well educated at all. Um, he'd only been in higher education for two years. He was largely self-educated. Um, again, incredibly bright, intelligent individual, an inquiring mind like, like very few um, around. But he grew up in a time where there was this great philosophical and scientific change going on. And he was part of that. And in Blackmore, he sort of met a, a kindred spirit, a soulmate, if you like. Um, because Blackmore himself, again, not educated, but a deep thinker, really did ponder the past, as well as carrying out his job. I suppose when you're a shepherd, you do have time sometimes to, to ponder. 
Um, and that's exactly what Huxley finds himself doing now. In the twilight of Huxley's life, he's up on the downs, he's pondering, he's thinking about life, the universe and everything. And he meets this 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 chap, Huxley, who's also not, he's, he's, he's not ill, he's perfectly well, but he's getting towards the end of his working life up there. Um, and he too is pondering all these big, big questions. And together they make this unlikely pairing. And they talk about stuff. They talk about deep time. Huxley is, is, is obviously, he knows his, his time is short, but it gives him comfort to think about the past. And not, not just the, the really deep past, the millions of years ago, but the past around the, the changes in the landscape the changes in people in just a few thousand years, I know it's just say just a few thousand, but when you're pondering 90 million years, a few thousand years is like a couple of seconds. So they start thinking about these things, this deep time and the landscape around us and Beachy Head and the Eastern Downland is about deep time. <laughs> they obviously, they chat about fossils a lot. I don't know about you, but I love fossils and I get so excited when we find them uh, on our excavations and things. But people have always been fascinated with fossils. There's examples from Sussex of Bronze Age burials surrounded by echinoid fossils. I mean, hundreds of them. And we do find them when we're excavating. Um, we were up at Butts Brow, which I'll talk about later on because it's all linked. And we were finding fossils in the in the ditch fields and things. Now, they occur naturally. Yep, Absolutely. But have they been replaced there? It's really hard to say, but we do collect them. Amazing things. Collecting. I was just talking about that. Both of these people were collectors. Um, Huxley had uh, academic collections. He had sort of scientific collections. But he also um, collected for himself. And uh, uh, and uh, Stephen Blackmore had his own collections. Now, later on in life, in the in sort of, I, th I think actually about the time that maybe just before he he met Huxley, he'd donated a huge amount of his collections to the um, Sussex Music Sussex uh, Archaeological Society at Lewis. Um, hopefully, they still have them today. But he also kept his own collections. He had his own special box that that was with him until the day he died, which were his his finest pieces. I love that idea. He gave. A, he was altruistic. He gave away much of the stuff he found, but actually he collected. His, he kept his special things right until his death. Now I'd love to find those special things. So far, no one has. They discussed as well changes in lifestyle. What the changes had happened on the downs? It's a living place. So, what has gone on in the last century, fifty years, hundred years, five hundred years? together they looked at that and we'll again come back to the all of these questions and things they were talking about they were actually both really keen on understanding the people not just the changes in lifestyle and downs but the people who lived there the custodians of the downs and that's you those of you listening to this now you are the custodians of the downs now they belong to the people the only way the downs are going to thrive in the future it's for people to get behind them, to people to understand, enjoy them, experience them. It's the only way. So you custodians of the Downs, you've got your part to pray too. And of course, they discussed the flora and fauna, the things around them. And we'll look at all these subjects now in one way or the other, hopefully. Now, very quickly, that's a fossil there of an echinoid or like a sea urchin. And just one of the things I love is, is folklore and the downs are full of folklore. And just one of them is that these were collected quite often um, well, right through history. Certainly in the 19th century, they were known as shepherd's crowns or sometimes fairy loaves. There are various different echinoids you can find out there. The fairy loaves tended to be the heart shaped ones. These were the shepherd's crowns. Um, and again, great that, that you sometimes find them sort of left outside cottages in the 19th century. We've got plenty of ethnographic sort of records of, of that sort of happening in Sussex. People were superstitious and they wanted things to protect them. They weren't, they, even in the 19th century, it's a great time of science. Yet at the same time, we are also worried about things like evil spirits weather as well the, 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 we just didn't understand everything things we didn't understand we wanted protection against and these things are seen as a form of protection. here we go again just as a quick aside irish thunderbolts now this relates to a, an excavation that uh, we did it just down the down the uh, down the coast from beachhead at crowlink um the coast guard cottage is there beautiful beautiful site crowlink if you haven't been there 
go down there, you can walk down from from uh, Friston. Absolutely stunning. And we excavated, we were lucky enough to excavate as part of a project with the National Trust, the Coast Guard cottages themselves, where these uh, these these hardy men worked and lived. And uh, on the on the the left, as you look at it, the screen there, you'll see one of the cottages. That's actually the kitchen. Uh, and and the, the thing you see in the corner there, the, the bottom right-hand corner, is the huge fireplace. And we actually found things like buttons right next to it. You can imagine someone sat there. Uh, the reason why it's so, it looks like the, the, the fireplace is raised is that there were floorboards and that was the space underneath the floor. Anyway, I digress. When we, which I do a lot of. When we were excavating this site, uh, there was one point where the soil seemed to be a bit more disturbed by the foundations and I um, asked the chap who was doing the excavation just to dig a bit deeper and when he did he turned up this object on the right and that's a rather beautiful Neolithic, small Neolithic axe so probably around five and a half thousand years ago. Now the reason why I'm talking about this now is that firstly it shows people have been on the downs for a long time. We've got a 19th century built in around 1822 Coast Guard cottage and uh, an axe form uh, created made from the the flint found around the downs from around five and a half thousand years ago about 3500 bce now what was so fascinating is that that was found within the foundation deposits of this this building now i can't be 100 percent sure that this hadn't just collected in a little gully and been sat there for five and a half thousand years but it did seem a bit unusual because nearby we also found a, a doll's eye and a couple of other objects. Just a possibility it had been deposited there. The reason why that's interesting is that in Ireland particularly, um, so we are being a, on a bit of dodgy ground here because we're say, transferring a, a tradition from Ireland to England. But in Ireland particularly, when people found these axes, people thought that they were thunderbolts made sort of real or lightning bolts, we should say. Um, and the way to protect your house from lightning strikes was to actually bury one of these lightning bolts underneath the foundations. Now, as I say, that could be a bit of a leap. It could also be archaeologically completely wrong. But when we were researching the properties, these houses, we found that actually they were largely built by Irish workers. So there is a possibility there, a lovely little possibility. And another one of these hidden stories, literally hidden beneath the foundations, side here, the, the downlands. Now, I'm not even going to talk that much about coastal change, but this gives you some wonderful, really, really tangible uh, depiction here of coast change and erosion, coastal erosion. The blue line towards the bottom of the picture is the coast in around 1830. So when these uh, Coast Guard cottages were built, the blue line to the north of that is where the coast is today. Now, so you can see that in, in sort of less than 100 years. No, sorry, that's absolute nonsense. In 200 years, less than 200 years, the coast has changed remarkably. 100 metres or so, over, well, I would, I would say in parts over 100 metres, down to around 75 metres. This is a huge amount of erosion in 200 years. Now, the, co the, the, the chalk coast is, is quite strange. In some areas, it erodes very quickly. In others, it doesn't. So you get this, it, it isn't sort of uh, uniform as you move along, but erosion happens. So if you think about that axe, which we looked at a minute ago, that was created by someone living on the downs. And if they had looked out, across Crowlink and out to sea, they probably wouldn't have seen the sea actually. It was probably a kilometre or so out. So this is serious landscape change. So what we see today as cliffs and coombs are actually valleys and hills to our Neolithic ancestors. Like I say, I'm going to just touch on these ideas. I want to get you interested. I want you to then take up the baton and find out more. I've been rabbiting on about the Neolithic. Let's look at it. Um, we have huge amounts of Neolithic uh, activity going on the Downlands and, and Blackmore and Huxley were, were, were really fascinated by it because Blackmore found so many of these flint tools. It looked like there must be a huge population up here. That's probably not the case, but certainly there's a huge amount of activity going going on here. We know that at Coombe Hill there's a, a Neolithic enclosure which was partly excavated, not, not necessarily properly in the, in the, I think it's the 40s and 60s or 30s and 50s, one of those two. 
And then uh, about four years ago, we were lucky enough to have an opportunity to excavate a, an enclosure that, that had been previously identified, but never dated at Butts Brown. In fact, in the photo there, in the bottom right hand, you can see part of the car park there at the top of Butts Lane. That's how close it is. Um, and some people did say, oh, it's a shame, it's a shame they built it around a car park. Honestly, I kid you not. Anyway. Here is uh, the, the earthwork, and that, those dots are actually people. They're some of our volunteers standing on the bank, which you can still see today, of this earthwork that surrounds Butts Brow and the beehive plantation. That's the, the circular uh, little um, wood, um, which you can again walk through today. And we've been excavating up there for, on and off for, for four years, so I think we've done three seasons now, probably just one more season to go before it can then be, become a scheduled ancient monument and be protected uh, legally. But what we found here is another causeway enclosure, which is it's unprecedented. It's quite common to get two enclosures together, but usually one is a causeway enclosure and one isn't. What am I talking about, causeway enclosures? Good point. Causeway enclosures are basically these monuments. They're the early, some of the earliest monuments we find in Britain. So don't think of them as, as camps or where people live. We don't think that's what's going on here. But they're formed of huge banks and ditches, in this case two metres across and probably banks about one to two metres tall at least, in places. Um, and they're called causeway enclosures because they are broken by sort of two or more entrances, if you like. They're not really entrances, but they, they are sort of, you could look at them, I suppose, as ways in. But the ditch basically is not continuous. Uh, and up until this year, we weren't sure that that was the case with Butts Brow, but this year we did prove that that ditch is not continuous and there are at least a series, there's at least three breaks in it, which does make it a causeway enclosure. I'm sure if the whole site was excavated, we would find them round and we're hopefully doing some more geophysics on it later on this year, which will, which will tell us exactly where those breaks are. Um, but it's an incredible site and to be part of a team that helped uh, discover this this new monument is it's it's yeah it's pretty special and it's right on your doorstep it's right on the the, the edge of the downs and we think that these these uh, well a few years ago a great theory is put forward that these causeway enclosures were the sort of tribal center points of neolithic society but i think we've sort of proved that's not the case now because we found two so close together it's still possible, it just doesn't feel right. It feels more like a group of people moving through a landscape. But again, I don't want to go on about that too much because uh, time is ticking. And that is a subject of a talk in its own right. But just Brown, the Neolithic, these are a couple of views of the ditch that we uh, uncovered this year. It's a ditch, I hear you all shout. How boring. Actually, it's fascinating, um, even for me, and I'm not a big fan of Neolithic ditches. But here we have this incredible ditch cut into solid chalk using just human power, antler picks, bones, simple tools. Well, I say simple tools, they're actually quite complex tools. Using these tools, though, no metalwork to dig out solid chalk. Absolutely incredible. And this ditch itself tells a fascinating story. It tells us that it was dug out in one go. Then at the bottom, you can just see there's sort of rubble at the bottom there. That contained actually fresh broken flints, struck flints, which had then been deposited at the bottom. They were so fresh. Had I found those flints in a field, I would have discarded them as being broken by a modern plough. It was amazing to actually be one of the first people to actually hold these things in our hands. Um, but then after that, part of the ditch had been backfilled and then used partially backfilled, probably for not that, maybe 100 years or so. It's hard to say at the moment because we're still doing the, the, uh, the, the, the science on this site to understand a bit more. And we're still examining all the artefacts from it. But it looks like these sites, they went through various phases of use and eventually they were filled up. They didn't, they weren't left to silt up. They were filled up. You probably, you would have seen them in the landscape as scars with banks. And that was a wonderful thing this year. We found a bank with pottery in it. So these are mysterious sites, but they show people have been up there for a long time. What is really important about this as well is these are the sites, the monuments of the people who first made that massive impact on the downed by deforesting it. Now that, that process is likely to have started previously in the Mesolithic, where people created um, uh, openings sort of in the forest to attract uh, animals like deer 
Um, if you create an opening, if you burn down a patch of forest, create a clearing, young uh, plants will grow through, they attract the game, you then bring the game to you, you don't have to go hunting it. It's the first time we start managing our environment and, well, first time that we can archaeologically prove we start managing our environment and our, our animals in this way. Um, so again, it's one of these things I, I often have to say, look, We've been doing this for a long time, manipulating the world around us. It's what we do as humans. But by the time this monument was, was created, these clearings were probably starting to get larger. And certainly by the end of the Neolithic period, just a millennia or so later, the downs were largely cleared of trees. It's in a momentous time. And they were cleared using those axes. Those axes, go back a few slides to, to that, that thunderbolt found under the Crowling Cottages. They were using those axes to clear the downs. See how everything is connected. Everything. Yeah, so the shepherd, Stephen Blackmore, didn't only meet scientists, and he met another one. He also met, he was a great friend of a, someone who went on to become uh, the editor of the local newspaper around here as well. Um, but anyway, he also met a very famous hoaxer. And that picture on the left, it says, working at Piltdown. I might give you a clue. So Charles Dawson uh, was the chap who, he was actually well respected for most of his time in the, in the, in the 19th and early 20th century as an archaeologist and, and Piltdown was taken to be a great discovery. Now, for those of you who don't know, Piltdown was where, uh, in Sussex, uh, where Charles Dawson found a skull. He thought he'd found the missing link, or that's what he told people. Um, it was actually later proved to be a hoax and combination of, I, I believe, uh, uh, primate skull with various other fossil remains. So he was quite well known as a hoaxer as well so shortly after this happened, um, but it took a while. It was accepted uh, accepted for a long time. Um, but we also know now that Dawson did undertake other hoaxes. There was a, something that he got on got to at Pevensey Castle, I believe, um, basically faking some Roman tiles there, not that he couldn't find Roman tiles. There are plenty, but I think he inscribed a couple of them. And then there's this one, this intriguing picture from the Sussex Archaeological Collections, I think number 39, um, on the right there, which shows a hafted Neolithic axe, a stone pick, a hooked implement, polished stone, and an arrowhead. Now, looking at those, I immediately get suspicious. Why, you might ask. Well, firstly, that haft is just odd. Uh, secondly, I should say, I don't know of very many hafted uh, Neolithic objects. If When they are found, which is extremely rare, they're in wetland conditions because that would just, it, it would be very rare for that to survive. That drawing actually, to me, makes it look like an antlers. I'm wondering if there is a little bit of truth in this, but we've just got it wrong a bit. Um, the arrowhead, yeah, you find arrowheads like that on the downs. Um, not exactly like that. Stone pick is unusual and the hooked implement I think would be completely unique. Um, depends on the size. We don't have that, unfortunately. But what we do is we do have this drawing. Um, these drawings are allegedly of objects that Dawson was shown by our man Stephen Blackmore. Now, we don't have much contemporary information about this. Stephen Blackmore was said to have found these near East Dean, um, probably on the remains of a barrow. He found the buried and then he picked it up and then the, it crumbled and so there was no evidence of the haft. But he told this story to um, to Dawson, who then reconstructed this haft from a sketch that Stephen Blackmore drew. Now, all of this was years after the event. All that was left was the stone. I don't know about the other objects. We've never seen them. But it does make you suspicious that uh, perhaps this... this uh, wonderful hall was not exactly all it seems but again this is Stephen Blackmore this is our humble shepherd and he is meeting the great good and perhaps the rather bad changes of lifestyle sheep on the downs now that's again a view of Butts Brow um, in fact taken this year and sheep on the downs a typical down on view open fields some scrub um, sort of scrubby hedgerow that sort of thing but mostly open fields with sheep, etc., in them. Now, we've already mentioned the Downs pre-farming um, and 
we've talked about the fact that that site, in fact, where there is a clump of trees now, is almost certainly detreed by the th about three and a half thousand BCE. But were they farming then? Well, yes, we think so, but not in the way we see it today. There wasn't a sudden clearance of the downs over a few years and everyone settled down and grew crops. For a start, it's not best place to grow crops on the top of the downs. There are much more fertile areas down the slopes towards the uh, towards the coast. And again, we do believe this is what's happening in the Neolithic. It certainly carries on happening throughout the prehistoric period that the lower slopes of the downs, and in fact, the, the lowlands are... Uh, where you grow your crops and then up the top is where you, you use animals to pasture. It's not as simple as that though. There is some agriculture and uh, crop growing going on on the downs. Certainly we find cereal pits and things like that. And, well, the other thing to question as well is when these monuments are built, are they actually built by people who are um, farmers or are they becoming farmers? It's, a, it's an idea really. But again, it just goes to show this is a complex situation that we're in. It doesn't happen overnight. There were fields and fields big and small right throughout history. There's a change all the way through it. Um, what we find is there are smaller fields at first, then these grow and grow and grow, and then they get smaller again and grow and grow and grow. It changes through time. At some points, there were quite a, a patchwork of fields on most of the what we'd call the Downland Estate today, apart from that area around Bullock Down. Although, if you go and look at Bullock Down now from Beachy Head, especially in the evening when the sun's setting, you'll see that that place is covered in historic and prehistoric field boundaries. Now, it's the Black Death that really breathes life into the Downs, or life as we know it today. Um, it's the rise of the middle classes and sheep. Um, basically, Post Black Death, there are fewer people around, and agriculture in this part of the world changes significantly. We move from being uh, predominantly growing crops and cereals into animal rearing, and in this case of this area around here, sheep. Now, this had started earlier on, but there's a say by the time the Black Death or post Black Death, fewer people around, lots of land lots of sheep. And that's what starts happening. The sheep boom really comes that medieval period. Sussex wool and, and southern British wool is, is known throughout the, the Europe as being some of the finest there. And of course you've got the other byproduct which is, is meat. Um, in that way it was a much more sustainable living for many people uh, than, than just crop growing. But the increase in sheep did really bring the decrease of people on the downs. There were still people living up there, far more than there are today, but sheep took over the landscape. Fields got bigger, there was less necessity to have people up there. You'd have shepherds and a few small settlements, but most people then moved back down into the towns. And the future, well, that's a great question. The future could bring more of this change. We're now looking at, at ways that we maybe could use our downland estate in, in a more sustainable way. We have to think about whether the sheep rearing and cattle rearing is, is the way forward. I, I don't have the answers to this yet, but I know there are many people looking at this right now and looking at the possibility of our changing uh, the what, what we grow and how we grow it. And this could mean physical change to what you see on the downs and that's really hard for many people to take but we have to remember this is not a museum this is not a landscape pres preserved in aspect there is a landscape that is used to change I should just mention there as well people often talk about rewilding and I think some of the talks are about it as well which is a wonderful subject rewilding on the downs could be done but basically what you'll end up with if you're not careful is scrub everywhere for I don't know, next 50 to 100 years, then you'll have some nascent growth of trees. If the trees can grow, and I've no idea what trees will grow up there with given climate change and also the, the, the soils up there. So rewilding is not something that personally I would want to see, but maybe a reimagining of the way we farm and thinking about how we can sort of both farm and be successful for those farmers as well, because they're living and it's a, it's a tough life but also farming for nature as well. It's something we'll be looking at. And uh, this is just something I like talking about. Sheep crime. Sheep crime, there you go, medieval sheep crime. Oh, I don't think the crime is actually being committed there, by the way. Might look like it, but I don't think so. But basically, did you know that first smuggling in England was not smuggling stuff in, it was smuggling stuff out. And that stuff was, well, not sheep themselves, 
but wool. Wool smuggling to, to to France in particular, and we were at war with France for much of the middle age, much of the medieval period. It was big business. So people from around here were well well known as smugglers, even back in the 14th century, getting those sheep out for good prices when we were told not to be trading with our enemies on the continent. But it went on. And that led to the most bountiful trade of smuggling itself. Now, the landscape around us, around Sussex and Kent, is renowned for being a hotbed of smuggling. And it's true, there was a huge amount of smuggling and smuggled items, this time coming into the country, again, mostly when we're at war with Europe and France. Um, and these, this, this, these items could include, at different points, brandy, tea, gin, all of these things. In fact, gin, go back to Crowlink uh, about a oh, good 20 minutes ago now, isn't it? Um, back to Crowlink, there was a gin called Genuine Crowlink. And this was really popular in London. And it was called Genuine Crowlink because it had been smuggled in from that area. Um, this picture is, a, is a, the wreck of the Nympha, Nympha Americana here, which is a Spanish ship. Uh, I think it was a Spanish ship that we'd taken. Anyway, um, what we actually have, those little ships coming in there are not um, people coming to help. They are actually French privateers who have helped drive it onto the ground. And those people down there are also not necessarily coming to help the poor uh, stranded crew of the ship. Their locals come down to rob what they can. And the little hut on the right of that picture is Berlin Gap. There was a small hut and a cannon placed there. And that, that sort of cleft in the rock is the gap itself. But smuggling was rife. Um, uh, don't get me on smuggling tunnels. That's another talk. There aren't any. But anyway, smuggling on the downs, there is, uh, it's, it's, even today, there are, there's evidence of that. If you look at place names particularly, um, in fact, Black Robin, uh, the farm just across from Beachy Head, a Black Robin in Kent was known, was a, another name for a smuggler. So is this, is this a, a sort of a relic of that, of that smuggling trade? Well, if you go to Black Robin Farm and you look straight down the valley, that leads you straight down to Berlin Gap, but not along the roads. So it could well be. But smuggling was going on. It's a way of life. And it's uh, something that, um, again, I think it's in, embedded in the culture, uh, uh, certainly the cultural stories that we tell of around here. Now, another bit of income, as well as smuggling, which I suppose many, well, in fact, many, many people were involved in, um, was trade in animals. I've hardly talked about the flora and fauna of the Downs. And again, I think there are people far better placed than me to do it. Um, but I do want to touch on just a couple of things. Birds like the wheat ear, the uh, Tennyson sea blue bird of March. The wheat ear is a wonderful little songbird that um, is seen in Britain still today, in predominantly in, in migratory times around Beachy Head in sort of March. And I see a lot of them in September. You see them lining up against the uh, along the wire fences and on the um, telegraph wires. Beautiful little birds. Um, I'm happy to see them in the landscape, but people in the past actually were happy to see them on their plate. Apparently, they're very tasty. They're only tiny, so I don't see how much meat there is on them. But the shepherds are actually paid a lot of money, uh, both by merchants and, and the, the, the well-to-do in Eastbourne, but also in London and big cities. So the shepherds used to go up there and make little traps and catch dozens and dozens and dozens and, in fact, hundreds of these sometimes in one day. And then they'd sell them to uh, these merchants for quite a lot of money. And often they'd make more money catching wheat ears than they would from their shepherding. So it did supplement their income, but it also has led to a dramatic uh, decline. In wheat ears, not just because of that, but it's the sort of landscape just decline, etc. But they're a wonderful bird. And when I was thinking about wheat ears and thinking about these birds, I always think about sort of a, a story in Eastbourne. And it's a story about how this bird saved a life by getting eaten and tasting so good. So again, it's one that we've covered many times before, but just to show you the depth and the, the, the breadth and the ridiculousness of the connections to the downs that we have around here is a great story, late seven, uh, mid 17th century, the family of the Wilsons who lived in what is now Compton Place. Uh, William Wilson, the head of the household was uh, Im implicated in various plots to get Charles I out of England whilst he was still alive, then after he'd lost his head, was implicated in being a supporter of Charles II, which he was, but he obviously couldn't admit it. So during the end of the Commonwealth period, so still he was seen as a bit of a troublemaker, a platoon of uh, dragoons came down 
and they, they started searching his house. Now, his wife um, was uh, far more uh, enterprising, let's say, than William. And she distracted this this platoon of or, or, or this I don't know this platoon I could be talking nonsense there anyway this group of of dragoons by um, asking them to join her in eating an incredible pie and that was a wheat ear pie and the captain of the dragoons had never tried this before um, and tried it thought it was wonderful during which time they're sitting down eating the pie she goes upstairs to um, her husband he says Mary what's going on. She says, we've got the dragoons in. I'm distracting him with a really good pie. They find any papers that will implicate him in any plots and burn them. The dragoons search the house. They find nothing. They go on their way. It's probably a bit fed up they didn't find anything, but also with satisfied bellies. Anyway, that story might be slightly apocryphal. I think there's some truth in it. But anyway, it shows that the, the, the wheat ear became a big thing. The Wilsons then supplied Charles II with wheat ears throughout uh, his reign. And it, the fact, it, does, it did appear on the Wilsons' crest as well. A bird saves a life by being eaten. Amazing. But a wonderful bird. And the other thing is about this bird, which is so incredible, is it's a migrant. Migration is, is something which is absolutely fascinating. And if we ever look at anything to do with this area of the country, you have to think about migration. Now, that map there shows you the migratory routes of, from of Western Europe and Africa into Asia of various species. But you'll notice that the wheat ear, wheat ear moves from, from Africa right the way through the Middle East and then up through Turkey, maybe stopping at Cyprus, and then across Europe and into Britain. Tiny bird, huge migration. The other birds we see around here as well are the, the, the things like swifts and swallows that are obviously important in Sussex because we think of them as possibly the martlets from the Sussex flag. Migration for a little bit. So I was talking about birds, wasn't I, and how they come in. And then there's a picture there. Of, again, you may recognise this person. This is the rather unimaginatively named Beachy Head Woman. Uh, one of the skeletons in our collection came in a box which said Beachy Head. We studied her a number of years ago, um, had her forensically examined and had a craniofacial reconstruction done. At the time, which is about three or four years ago, it was said that she was um, she had enough skeletal traits on her skull to say that she was sub-Saharan African. Absolutely amazing. She was Roman as well. Not so amazing in that case because she'd grown up in Eastbourne as well. We could tell by the the, um, the isotopes in her teeth. So she grew up here. She's of Ro she's from the Roman period, about 150 AD, or um, uh, yeah, 100 uh, whatever that is, a couple of thousand years ago. <laughs> Not quite. Um, and originally we thought she was of sub-Saharan African descent. That not that unusual in Roman times? We know that there are African Roman citizens all over Britain, on Hadrian's Wall, uh, in York, many places, Canterbury. But we had some DNA analysis done on her, and it actually turns out that she is not from sub-Saharan Africa, but from Cyprus. Um, it doesn't really matter where she's from. The fact is that she, like the birds, migrated, and it always makes me think when I'm up on the downs, why, <laughs> especially on a foggy day or a day like today where it's pouring down with rain what would she have thought about being there and then I, I started thinking about the migratory birds and seeing the swifts and swallows and just thought well just maybe and this is me getting whimsical just maybe though she was actually thinking about those birds that she saw in her homeland of cyprus which would she would have been familiar with which she saw also in the south of britain thousands of miles away maybe that gave her some legitimacy to being here i'm not sure as i say it's it, it's a bit whimsical but I think it's it's something worth thinking about. Think about migration when you're there. Think about migration of these people we know who've come into Britain and also of these birds. It brings up that question of what we call home as well. Is home where we live or is it the, the birds and the wildlife and the flowers and fauna around us? Is it how we feel? It's fascinating. One of the last things I want to look at for this talk, because I'm really coming up to the end of my time, is... The downs and the, the, the cliffs around Beachy Head, are they a barrier or are they a beacon? I think through time they've changed. They've certainly been both. Now you see here the, the uh, Save for Defence poster there. It's probably the White Cliffs of Dover, but they often used the, the, the uh, Seven Sisters instead because they are whiter. Um, it's a long story. Anyway, 
it's that archetypal view of Britain, isn't it? There's a soldier, he's probably in the Home Guard, he's defending Britain, saving Britain, and the archetypal view of Britain are the White Cliffs. The bottom, le- bottom yeah, left, as I look at it, um, picture there, is, is of Crowlink again. We're back there. This is ploughing on the downs. This brings, I could t- talk just about that picture for 45 minutes. This shows that the downs are, have been utilised in different ways at different times really beautifully, doesn't it? Ploughing the cliffs right up to the downs. When you have to, you have to do it. Maybe it's something we have to do again. I don't know, but it's something we have to consider. There's the Coast Guard cottages behind it, and there's the cliffs. This is showing this archetypal view. It's defend Britain, defend this way of life. Yet then, top left, we have that uh, film, a very powerful film by a Syrian refugee, uh, which is projected onto the the same cliffs at Dover. Those are the cliffs at Dover. Uh, Rise above fear, refugees welcome. That's not always been the case, and I'm not sure it is always the case today. And the reason why I have a picture there at the bottom, that's Charlotte Smith, who is actually a poet. And uh, she's, thankfully, she's gaining a lot more popularity now. She was a poet writing in the 18th century, fat and late, very uh, late 18th century, early 19th century. She was of the Gothic, uh, form, uh, Gothic group, um, and she wrote some incredible uh, poems, including a huge 700-line-long poem about Beachy Head. And in that poem, what was really interesting, um, it is, it, it's, it's nostalgic, but it's not nostalgic for reasons you may think. She was writing at the time of the Napoleonic Wars when many people saw just this save Britain, defend the coast, defend us, using the White Cliffs as this symbol of defence, defiance. This is barrier Britain. She, in her poem, is writing about it as being very different and actually bemoaning the fact that that is the way it's being promoted. She was actually writing at a time when she remembered being on the cliffs of the the, the, the downs and getting excited seeing ships coming over, seeing who was coming. She saw it as a welcoming beacon for people from Europe and the sharing of ideas across the channel. Now, we know that that's gone on for thousands of years. We, have, we know that there's been intercontinental trade, perhaps even the same tribes living on both sides of the channel. In fact, before that, there wasn't even a sea here. There was a river. But it has to be seen as both barrier or beacon. This is a question that I'm asking you now. What, which is it? I know that people have opinions on both sides and even people very recently that I've spoken to have very strong views that it's actually a beacon, not a barrier. Now, obviously it depends who you talk to and what papers you read, but that's something that I'd like you to all go away and think about if you can. That's the end of my talk for now. I could go on for so much longer, but hopefully what I've given you in that 45 or so minutes is a spirit of the downs an idea of what it means to some people and an idea of those interconnected stories that are there if you just scratch beneath the surface. It's a fascinating area. It's changed so much over time and that's not a bad thing. It's going to change in the future. We've got a lot of issues coming coming up at the moment, both in terms of climate change and in terms of subsidies for farming and many other things. Planning laws is another big one. But let's let's think about it in this way, that we are connected to all these stories because we appreciate the Downs, we enjoy the Downs, we can all be connected to these stories. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you do, who you are, what knowledge you have. You're part of this landscape if you want to be. And I think deep down, we all want to be. Well, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's a bit of a ramble, but just get out and enjoy the downs if you can. All right. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.